Okay, uh, so we're going to start here with uh, chapter 12, and it is about chemical equilibrium. And uh, once again, all these notes can be found up on our Canvas site. And if you want to use them, you can. And uh, if you don't, you don't have to. Uh, so chemical equilibrium um, really involves the idea of a certain type of reaction. And it is a reaction that really is a reversible reaction. So we have this reaction, and perhaps you recognize these maybe when he talked a little bit about weak electrolytes. Uh, this is basically a reversible reaction. And what that means is there's really sort of two directions to this reaction. Uh, so by the way, on the left-hand side of the arrow, those are our what? Yeah, those are the reactants. I like it. All right. Okay. And on the right hand side is our products, right? All right. That's good. I was going to have to send everybody home. I have one. All right. So uh, when we have a reversible reaction, uh, as we go from reactants to products, that is what is sometimes referred to as the forward direction. And what will happen at some point is enough products will be made that they will decide, hey, we want to go back the other way. So those products will sort of recombine and head back towards the reactant side. So as the reaction heads from products to reactants, uh, that is what is referred to as the reverse direction. Now, sometimes people have a really sort of wrong misunderstanding about what chemical equilibrium is. They hear the word equilibrium, they hear equal, and they think, well, it must be equal amounts on both sides of the arrow. And that is not what chemical equilibrium actually refers to. What chemical equilibrium refers to is actually the rate. So some chemical kinetics, uh, and it is the rate of the Ford reaction will eventually equal the rate of the reverse reaction. So really what that, that is really the definition of chemical equilibrium. It's basically as fast as it goes from reactants to products, it's gonna kind of hang a U-turn and head back the other way and go from products back to reactants. So what does that mean? That means that when chemical equilibrium is actually reached, you pretty much lock everybody into place. And what I mean by that is you lock everybody into place in terms of their concentration. If you're talking about gases, whatever their pressures are, because just as quick as you kind of make some products, they send back the other way. So it's like an equal balance of going back and forth, but you do not again have an equal amount on both sides in most cases. It just means wherever all the reactants are or wherever all the products are, once they reach equilibrium, they basically will maintain those concentrations until frankly you do something that screws it up. So as long as you don't do anything that screws it up, everybody will maintain basically the concentrations they're at. And they're as fast as it goes one way, it comes back the other way just as quickly. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> So the state uh, of where the concentration of all the reaction products remain the same, uh, because again, the rate here is equal going back and forth. When something reaches chemical equilibrium, it sometimes is deceiving sort of visually. Uh, you may look at it and go, well, this reaction is done. Not much is going on here. You know, you may look at a, a beautifully drawn beaker and you may look at it and go, well, Kind of looks like it's done. Not much is happening there. But if you were to sort of super zoom in on the molecular level of what is going on in that reaction, what you will see is it is you have a lot of activity of guys going to the products. You have guys going back to the reactants. Again, there's a lot of that activity to maintain chemical equilibrium and to keep everybody at their concentrations. Uh, but again, on sort of the uh, molecular level, or I'm sorry, on the big level there, it looks like not much is happening. Uh, but if you really do sort of zoom in there, there's a lot of activity that's happening. And that's why on the macroscopic level, it's sometimes referred to as being static. Again, not appearing that much is happening. 
uh, but definitely there is a lot to go on. <clears throat> So for example, if we have this reaction here, we got a little H2 plus some N2, a little ammonia. So at the beginning of the reaction here at like time zero, it is all about the reactant. So you can see we pretty much have all reactants present. We have none of the products at the very beginning of this reaction. As the reaction starts to proceed in this case, we could assume that at the very beginning here, it is the forward direction that is going to occur. And because of that, what we will start to see is what we see on this graph, we need to use up some of our reactants to actually start making some products. So at the very beginning in this particular example here at time zero, because all we have are reactants, the reaction pretty much got ahead in that forward direction. At some point, we will build up enough products that it will start to come back the other way. And you can see that the product sort of increased pretty good here, but it is starting to level out at this point. And that's because some of those products are now heading in the opposite direction. They're heading back the other way. We also see at that point a less of a decline here in our reactants as we start making enough products that the reverse reaction could actually start to occur. And at some point, what will happen is, again, the rate of that forward reaction and the rate of the reverse reaction will equal each other. And that basically occurs right about here, where pretty much all of the lines basically plateau out because all the lines end up being straight at that point. Am I making more reactants and products at this point? No, the concentration of reactants and products are really not changing at this point, right? Otherwise the line will continue up, right? Or continue down when it levels out, it's basically remaining constant. And that is because again, at this point, our rate of our forward reaction has equaled our rate of our reverse reaction in this particular case. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about this here. So initially in this case, uh, in this particular reaction, we have no H2 or CO2 present. Uh, so the reverse reaction could not occur. So again, if you're starting out with just reactants, it will basically kick off that forward direction. So at the beginning here, we're gonna kick off that forward direction. We're going to start to increase some of these guys, which will then kick off the reverse reaction occurring. And once again, at some point, it will reach equilibrium in terms of the rate of each of those. And once again, whatever their concentration is, once they reach equilibrium, they will maintain it. Maybe this is four, two molar, you know, three molar, two molar, whatever it may be, but they'll be able to maintain those concentrations because the rate of that reverse and forward reaction definitely do equal each other. So if you ever look at sort of a diagram, uh, that's definitely how you know equilibrium is reached. Uh, here we're at the start, so we have not reached equilibrium. We're starting to see some decrease in the reactants, we're starting to see some increase really in the products. But again, once you see that really leveling out of those guys, uh, that is definitely when that equilibrium has been reached. So if we look at this particular example here, a little bit of water, some carbon monoxide, making some hydrogen gas and carbon dioxide. If we, in this case, added more water to this flask that contains all these guys. so. At this point, this guy has reached equilibrium and we decide we're going to add some more water to this flask. Take a second and decide how will everybody's concentration change as a result of adding water to this? Would it go up? Would their concentration go down or would it stay the same? So take a moment here, think about it. So we got this guy in a box, a flask basically. 
and we decided to add a little bit more of the water to it. So for each of those guys there, will their concentration go up, will it go down, or will it stay the same? So take a moment. So let's talk about it. So in this particular case, I'm going to add some more water. So let's start with CO. Would this concentration stay the same? Would it go up? Would it go down? What do you think? Not everybody at once. It should decrease, decrease. You say they, so it would decrease. So let's think about this, right? If we added water to this situation, would that make the forward direction happen or the reverse direction of this reaction? It would cause the forward direction to occur, right? In order to cause reactions to occur, the more you have of something right, the easier they're going to be able to come together right and start reacting. So really by adding the water here, it's going to kick off the forward direction to occur. There's gonna be more water to react with the carbon monoxide. And as was correctly said, that's going to cause the carbon monoxide's concentration to decrease, right? Because you need carbon monoxide, you need water to make the products. That means the H2 concentration should then go it should go up, right? Because we're making more products. We also should see the CO2's concentration go up as well. How about the water? What will happen with the water concentration? It will go down. What you would probably though see is first it would artificially go up because frankly you added it, right? So it's got to go up. But then as the forward reaction starts kicking off, it will then start to work its way back down as it reacts with the CO. You may even find it actually ended up being more than what you started with only because you artificially sort of added it, but that should be the trend you see. It'll spike because you added it. And then as that forward reaction starts to kick off, you'll start to see it sort of come down. Any questions on any of that there? <laughs> All right, so if we look at the same reaction though, and we add H2 in this case, what will happen to everybody's concentrations? So what will happen to water's concentration in this case, if we add H2? We'll go up, we'll go down, we'll stay the same. It should go up. So same logic here. When I add H2, that is a product, right? And now I have more products, which means should the forward direction or the reverse direction of reactions happen? the reverse direction should happen. So by adding more products, we should expect the reaction to head in that direction, uh, which means we would expect water now to be made and we would expect this concentration to increase. We would also expect obviously CO's concentration there to increase. CO2's concentration will go, which way? Well, the H2 is going to react with the CO2, right? And that's going to make both of the reactions in this case, right? So on the forward direction, you're not going to just make one. It's going to make both of those, right? Because in order for H2 to react, it's got to go bang into some CO2, right? Break some bonds, and that carbon is going to be made as well, right? The CO. Other questions? <clears throat> So in this particular case, because the reverse reaction is happening, we would expect the CO2's concentration to decrease as it is needed to make some of the reactions on the other side. And for the H2, again, we'll see sort of the same idea. It will artificially go up because you added it, but as the reverse reaction happens, we will see it come back down uh, reacting with CO2, right? Question on any of those there. <clears throat> All right, so we looked at that. So let's talk about really the letter that brings you this class, which is the capital K. Capital K is the equilibrium constant. And that is the letter this class brings you. We're gonna learn about every single K you could ever not wanna know about in this class. And eventually we'll get to some other letters, but it's all about the Ks here. So if we have a reaction such as this, we can actually write a equilibrium constant expression for it. 
And that is really, as you'll see here, K is always the concentration of your products divided by your concentration of your reactants. And that's what we see here. So the NO2 is our products. We also do use the coefficient as the exponent. And here that is our reactant. And here the coefficient is one. So there is no exponent there. And it equals that number. Uh, we'll talk a little more about that in a bit. But a couple of things about the equilibrium constant. Again, it should be capital K. Lowercase k is the rate constant, yeah, in kinetics. So lowercase k is actually the rate constant. Capital K is the equilibrium constant. One nice thing about k is, frankly, it is just a number. So unlike a lot of things in chemistry, you don't need units for it. It is actually just a number. And we'll talk about what that number will tell us. But in general, to write the equilibrium expression, we basically take our products over our reactant. And again, we actually do use the coefficients from the balance equation as the exponents. And this will give us our K value, our equilibrium expression. So the law of mass action holds that for a reversible reaction at constant temperature, uh, the ratio of the reactants to the products will always give you a constant value. It is an equilibrium constant, which means that value is the same value for the reaction. As long as you do not change the temperature, the equilibrium constant will always be the same for that reaction, regardless of how much you start with, which is another very common thing that's hard for people to understand. And what I mean by that is, for example, you could start with all reactants and let this reaction roll to equilibrium. And when you calculate the equilibrium constant, it will be a certain number. You can start with some reactants, some products, and let it roll to equilibrium. And when you calculate the equilibrium constant, it will be the same number. You can start with all react products, no reactants, let it roll to equilibrium. It will always end up at the same numerical value when you take the products over to reactants like this. And that's sometimes confusing. People are like, well, in this experiment, I use like way more of the first guy than I did in the second experiment. It really doesn't matter. It will always reach the same ratio of products to reactants, regardless of how much you start with of reactants or products. The only thing that will affect the value is the actual temperature. So if you did a reaction at 25 degrees Celsius and let it get equilibrium, you would have an equilibrium constant. If you change the temperature to 40 degrees, you would have a different value for the equilibrium constant between say 25 and 40 degrees, the values would be different. But if you then did that reaction at 40 degrees nonstop, all kinds of different amounts, you will always end up with the same value at 40 degrees as long as you don't change the temperature and keep it at 40 degrees. So it is a constant value. It doesn't matter sort of where you start in the process, how much you start of in terms of reactions and products. Again, that ratio of products to reactions will always end up at the same value. Any questions on that? 